Hello and welcome back to the Welsh Premiership Podcast and the first podcast of 2021. Today we're joined by former Thanetti player and the current personal trainer for a lot of the regional and Premiership players, Craig Hawkins. Craig, how are you? How's your Christmas? Been? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, I'm nice and relaxed and actually didn't have to rush around so much. Um, the thought of it didn't sound much fun, but I've actually relaxed more than any other year. So it's been quite nice. Craig, you won the league and the Welsh Cup with Llanelli as captain. How did you feel, yeah. guys, in the side to our success? And what are some of your best memories from those times? Um, yeah, it was great. I just um, tasted it getting very close at the start when I was a bit younger. I think we lost we lost the cup final, my first one, to uh, to Neath. Uh, Neath had a very strong team at the time. They had uh, Gravel was playing, uh, Iros Ems in the second row, Gwyn Price was hooker. Um, they 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 were they were quite strong and some some great backs as well. So um, we were in the game until the last twenty minutes, and then they they kind of I think they won it by two scores in the end. And then uh, to get that close just makes it a little bit more sweeter. When uh, I think the the second time, then we um, we beat Pontypridd, and then the third time we beat Carmarthen Quinn. So yeah, I've won I've won two and lost lost one. Uh, so, yeah, you played for Llanelli for a number of seasons with a lot of players who uh, went to play regional rugby and international rugby. Uh, who yeah, are some yeah. of the most talented players you played with at Llanelli? Um, I'd say uh, probably more from a, because I'm a forward. I, uh, I'd say Aaron Shingler, Nick had strong players. Um, one of the most talented forwards probably would be Ben Morgan that went on to play for England, number eight. Um, such an explosive guy. He came up. He turned up at Clenethy. Actually, he was. He wasn't very. Um, he wasn't very well conditioned. Let's say so. He came. He came carrying a few pounds, and I think the Scarlets kind of had an eye on him as well. So they give him a program, and uh, he was. He was just full of fast twitch fibers. We found out he was so so explosive. A great player. Uh, and then in the backs, probably you got like Nick Reynolds and Scott Williams were the best. Sent the partnership. I I capped in the side with they they were, they were very strong together those two. And Craig, you also played for the Scarlets. Then, what are your, some of your favourite memories with them? And how do you find the difference between regional rugby and Premiership rugby? Um, I think yeah. First of all, going back on the experience of Scarlets, it was great. You know, because I was I was kind of played eighty percent of my rugby, seventy percent with Clancy, but I'd always go up and when I was called upon to. To uh, to be with the Scarlets, um, and I've always had good experiences. I tasted a little bit at, at Parker's, uh, the old Stradie ground as well, which was great. Um, uh, and it was two great hookers that I was up against, obviously Ken and Matthew Reece Smiler. Um, but the difference, I suppose, is um, obviously the pace of the game, which was which was no problem for me. I, you know, the quicker the better for me. But I I kind of always fighted with being a bit heavier. My natural structure was only, you know, I used to battle the state at 90 kg and you had Ken and Matthew were tipping the scales over 100. So I, I'd say it was the, it was probably the size difference um, um, more than anything, I'd say. And you had spells with Swansea, Bridgend and Dunvant. What are your favourite yeah. memories for playing for these clubs? Oh, Dunvant is, you know, that, that's my club. I've, I've been there since, since I was six or seven playing junior rugby and... Um, it, it, it's great now that I've finished my rugby. I've actually gone back there and for the last three or four years I've been player coach. So that Dunvant has always been my you know home club and I have great memories of being down there with my family and stuff. Um, Swansea was great because after I went to Hawke's Bay after being with the Wales under 21s in New Zealand to experience that. And then when I came back, um, it was halfway through the season and um, Paul Moriarty, had a neck problem so I, I filled in there and that was great because it was when Scott Gibbs came back and um, so to rub shoulders with him was great uh, other clubs Bridgend yeah that was a great experience I had a couple of years there um, had a successful year I think Hugh Samuel took over so he brought in Alfie and a couple of the other David James so yeah, it, was a, it was a good club that was yeah as Tobias mentioned you played for a few different clubs in the Premiership uh, who are the best players you come up against in the Premiership? Uh, in the Premiership, um, I'd say that, uh, a guy that I had a lot of respect for, we used to go toe-to-toe a little bit, was 
Uh, probably could have gone on a bit further. There was Gravel, the blindside flanker for Neath. He was he was one of the toughest players, especially um, in the forwards I came across. Uh, Gil and Price, now, obviously now doing really well with the darts. He was a great hooker. Ashley James was another another top hooker. Played for Pontypridd with Jen Neath. Um, yeah, they they the players that kind of stand out in the forwards. Um, and obviously. Couple of sharp backs. Marlon Quinn's always had a good array of uh, backs. Obviously, you were around in the Premiership for quite a long time, and obviously, you had your time with the Scarlets as well. In your yeah. the, some of the regional youngsters, do you think they benefit more from playing in the Premiership or in the Academy A leagues? Um, well, speaking for when I played the Premiership, it was definitely they benefit more from playing in the Premiership. Um, I, I know that maybe the Premiership has changed quite a lot in the last five to ten years, but uh, you look at someone like um, I played a lot against is, is the Wales Luke said at the moment uh, when Jones, you know, he 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 did all his learning, I believe, at at, um, at that level. So I've got personal experiences of that as well. When I, you know, I won't mention names, but when I was with the Scarlets and trained with them, there'd be players that probably didn't make the twenty-two or twenty-three who were top professionals and they'd come down and scrummage in the premiership. This was going back like, you know, maybe eight, 10 years ago, we play Ebervale Vale and a lot of top, top props came into that league and they got sent backwards a few times. I don't think they were expecting it. So I, I think you get, you definitely learn, especially scrummaging, I'd suppose, more than any other skill. Maybe it's quite different being a halfback or a fullback, but I think you can learn a lot, lot being a forward in the Premiership rather than playing in academy games. And you had a spell out in New Zealand with Hawks Bay. How did that move come around? Um, it was, it, I, I came, we had a successful Wales in the 21s and we won the Grand Slam and uh, Chris Davey was the UIC um, connection. He, he kind of put me, started talking about would you go away and stuff. And he was, he was friendly with a guy called Cowboy Shaw who played flanker for New Zealand. He was well, he was the flanker actually in the famous game that Wales should have won in the Arms Park. So we got talking and they needed hooker at the time. And so I went over and lived in Napier. And um, that was a great experience because we won we won the NBC. And the other the other hooker actually me was Mo Schwalger. He ended up coming to the Scarlet Scarlets and five years later. So um, yeah, that, that was that was a nice touch. Uh, how did the standard of rugby down in New Zealand compare to the game up here in Wales? Uh, back then, it, 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 it was a step up. Not so much on skill and ability, but it was when I got there, the, the standards that they, that they want from you in training, you know, like I, I ended up playing about four or five games to get used to the rugby for, uh, you know, that you play your local club rugby before going into your provincial Hawke's Bay. So I played for a team called the Pirates and they were just kind of, like our semi-pro or maybe maybe even the championship standard. But their training, you know, you, you don't cut corners, you get pulled up. And not get pulled up by coaches, you get pulled up by your own players, which was like massive culture shock to me. So, okay, these guys take it pretty serious at any level. Um, so I, I, I'd say probably standards and training more than anything. You also represented the Barbarians as well. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was it was that that was great actually because we played um, we played the combined services, so we spent a bit of time with the navy before for a couple of days and they sh they showed us a good time around. I think it was either Plymouth or Portsmouth. Um, yeah, so that 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 was good and then you know to play with some top players um, on the day and and a real strong combined services team that had quite a lot of Fijian boys in it. Um, yeah, that was that was great playing for the Barbarians. You're now a qualified personal trainer, and I know you used to pride your game on your fitness, but was the personal training bit, uh, did you do a lot of that alongside your rugby commitments? Or? Uh, I started near the end, yeah. Um, it was just something I was always interested in, and I, I picked the brains out of a lot of conditioning coaches that I had. Um, and I, I probably learned more from them than any course I've done, you know, like um, how to manage certain individuals, how to get the best out of certain people. Uh, there was a guy called, when I was at the Scarlet's, Brad Harrington. I think he he worked with George George North when he was coming through. And he, he I think he went on, yeah, he was the Wallabies conditioning coach. 
Uh, I think he, he left the post last year. But um, yeah, I used to kind of go in his office after wake sessions, kind of sit down, have a cup of tea with him, talk about certain training programmes. And um, yeah, it just made sense then for when I finished was to go straight into something like that. Um, how has COVID affected the way you can work as a personal trainer? Well, when it first happened, I, you know, because I work out of, of a little gym in Dunvant, right? Um, I kind of, everyone had the panic buttons on how income was going to come in. And but then I, I just, you know, got a couple of connections all around the world, like London, Dubai, friends from everywhere. And they, they've always said to me, oh, I wish, wish I lived in Swansea. You could, I'd love you to train me. And then it kind of forced my hand. They contacted me saying, oh, you could actually train me over Zoom. Everyone's using Zoom. And then within three or four weeks of that, I was coaching people from all around the world, you know, and, and old teammates. They said, oh, you know, I'm stuck in the house. I want to get fit. So it, it just took off every week. It just got busier and busier. Obviously, you work with a number of uh, current professional rugby players. How... Just how fit are these professional rugby players and how important is strength and conditioning in, in professional rugby now? Oh, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it takes on another level. You know, if, you, if you're not at your physical peak, I think especially international and regional rugby, you'll just get found out. Um, yeah, when, when the players were away from their professional coaches, conditioning coaches and stuff, they, they you know, I ended up, a couple of them approached me because their conditioning coaches were made furlough. So I don't think they could make any contact with them. So however fit these boys are, they still like someone telling them what to do and, and so on. You know, for example, I trained Josh Adams and Gareth Davis, um, Dan Thomas, the Bristol Bears. Uh, yeah, they're just amazing engines. You wouldn't believe it. Probably a lot fitter than we were going back five, ten years ago. Oh, yeah, you touched upon it there. Um, but what current players are you working with at the moment? And the question everyone wants to know is, uh, who's the fittest? Um, well, most of the pro players now have gone back to their conditioning coaches. So what I'll do is, if they have a bit of downtime, um, like three or four weeks off, and they're told just to just keep going, I, I'll you know I trained Ali Davis a couple of days ago, the Saracen scrum half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he's unbelievably fit. He, well, it has to be because of his position, I know, but. One of the fittest pros I've probably gone up against, and we used to have little competitions, whether it be in the gym or uh, yo-yo test or a 1K run, was Aaron Shingler. Um, you know, unbelievable engine on that guy. And you work with a number of ex-pros as well, like Jiffy and Shane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their fitness up when you when you work. Uh, um, we, yeah, Jiffy just doesn't realise how old he is. He's just so fit. He's just and he's so competitive. So, like, 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 like I learned from other conditioners, what I learned with Jiffy is, if you put something on the board and it's like a target, and sometimes I'll just tell, you know, oh, one of the boys just smashed that time. You go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that one. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and Shane's the same. And what they don't realise, they all secretly DM me saying, oh, what time did? Um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite funny actually. So when I when I trained Gareth in the summer or Alan, um, I'd have like a DM from Reese Webb saying, "Oh, what time do they get? I'll, I'll give that a go tomorrow." <laughs> so uh, yeah, the boys are just slightly competitive. Yeah. And uh, to finish off, Craig, we got a teammates quiz for you. Yeah, go so on. All the players you played with, who's the worst dressed? Uh, I'd probably say. Um, Matt Gilbert, he played, he went on to play for Bath after Knesley and he's, um, he went, he, I think he played for Luxborough then. Yeah, Matt Gilbert, I think he got dressed in the dark, mate, it's like so bad, he wouldn't believe it. Either him or Samson Lee. What sort of stuff did they come out with? Uh, what's that? What sort of stuff do they wear? Uh, Samson Lee would go for dub, double track suit, same colour. <laughs> <laughs> and Gumby was... I think the bootleg and uh, bootleg jeans and cats were gone miles ago. He was still rocking up in cats and cat boot tops. <laughs> and uh, who's the best drinker you've seen? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Probably go as far as saying someone like... Um, can you remember a Fijian player called Joe Vatiaki? He was tight head prop. I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he came to Dunvant. I don't think he was even used to drinking, but we kind of clocked 
like he was on, he was on, he was on one. We were getting after one, and then we played Neath at home, and we clocked the barmaid because we had beer tickets. It was like back in those days, it was five beer tickets, yeah. and he had collected twenty five. And we looked over him about nine o'clock, and he he he'd, he'd obviously drunk his twenty five pints because he was really tight. He wasn't going to give any other way, and he was just fine. He was just sitting there like happy as day, maybe twenty five pints in. <laughs> But uh, in fairness, he was about 25 stones. He had a slight advantage. <laughs> and uh, who's the best changing room DJ you had? Uh, changing room DJ, probably Gareth Davis. Yeah. Scrum off. Yeah, he liked his tunes. They weren't bad either. What sort of tunes do you get on when you're doing your sessions? Uh, I like a bit of house house music and uh, old, some old school tracks. Yeah. Yeah, get the, get the old school uh, tracks on. And uh, without uh, revealing too much, who's the biggest liability on a night out? Um, there's, there's quite a lot of those, but I, I'm not just saying this because we spoke about him at the start, but Johnny Lewis is a, is a proper <laughs> liability. <laughs> you know, I can tell you a couple of stories I, um, I won't get into, but yeah, he, he's an emotional wreck when he's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd definitely be Johnny Lewis. And if you're stuck on a desert island, who is the teammate you'd most want to be stuck with and the one you'd least want to be stuck with? Um, probably most like to be stuck with Nick Cud. Probably like be able to relax. Probably be able to get us off there in fairness to him as well. <laughs> uh, least, least would probably be someone like... Um, that's hard to say, really. Uh, probably Sean Hopkins, just play prop for Clancy. Yeah, it'd probably be him. You'd probably be able to smell him on the island. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a wrap for this episode then. Thanks. Thanks, but thanks for your time, boys. Thanks a lot. Uh, remember to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Wash And if you enjoyed this episode, then feel free to go and watch the rest of the channel. Thank you and goodbye.